You are listening to Fanfa Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Lowcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. You're listening to Making Tracks. This is episode 115. I'm your co-host, Mark Newbold, and joining me today is a man who, if he was made from Lego bricks, well, there just wouldn't be enough Lego bricks. Mark, how are you doing? <laughs> Uh, yes, that's only because of my ego. If you had to build me in Lego bricks and build my ego, then you'd never have enough Lego bricks. I'm good, dude. How are you? I'm very good. You can't make Lego without ego, can you? I'm <laughs> exactly. very good. Life has been busy and crazy and mad. I'm chasing my tail, even though I haven't physically got one. I feel like I do. How about you? Because we've seen each other a lot lately, and this is unprecedented, isn't it? Yes, you know, we, we actually chose to record in the studio, so to speak, rather than, you know, in the back of some dirty closet or changing room or what have you. But it's been fun. I've had a really interesting week, actually, you know, since we last saw each other. Tell us more. I'll tell you, so it's actually quite interesting, at least for me anyway, um, maybe not for everybody else. Basically, for those who don't know, I work at Sky in post-production. I'm a colourist, so I basically make things look pretty and all that kind of stuff. And we've been doing tests with virtual production, which is basically to you and me and those who know Star Wars, that's uh, stagecraft and using the volume to shoot things. So we've done lots of different sequences in all different kind of scenarios, including some space and science fiction-y type stuff, just to kind of see beyond the realms of Lucasfilm and Disney+, Plus, what the benefits could potentially be for British broadcasters and UK production companies to use virtual production instead of going on location. One thing they don't kind of show you in the gallery is that it takes a long time to get this stuff really working, <laughs> you know, so... There... So there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. It's, it's very involved. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's very involved. And I mean, obviously, it's still emerging technology and some of the shoots where the guys kind of came back and, you know, they had two weeks on A volume anyway. And they were kind of like, yeah, we basically didn't get anything working until like the last hour or so in the day and we kind of had to run just to film what we could just so we could keep our schedule so that was quite interesting but also when we put it into the edit suites and we kind of look at it in the grade and stuff we can start to see where the real benefits are and even you know we were using it for stuff in a city and in a street and in cars and all that kind of stuff so it was you know we really tested it and it holds up pretty well there's a lot of extra work you still need to do which i think kind of comes down to experience as well potentially the more we go and use virtual production in our productions it will get easier and and the little things that maybe we had to spend time to try and improve and fix in the grade and the DI, we won't necessarily have to do next time. So it's all a learning curve, but it's great fun. Hi, this is Steve Grad from Pawn Stars. I approve and I authenticate Fanta tracks. We were, as we have been, like I say, for the last, what, four weeks, yeah. we've done MCM London, Gateshead. Yeah, Gateshead and Alicia. Yeah. Croydon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gateshead and Alicia with Croydon last week. And this weekend, we were at MCM Comic Con in Birmingham. Yep. You were there as a punter, which is a bit of a change for you, isn't it? I was, yeah. As I kind of figured out when I was there, the last time I was actually at a convention and not, you know, an exhibitor with Rebel Legion or the 501st was actually in 2007 at Star Wars Celebration Europe, you know, the first one, which just feels like a million, million years ago. So it was really different and, you know, in a really positive way because obviously there's no pressure on me or people I was with to be there at a certain time and in costume and what have you. You know, we were able to wander around and shop, which is quite a rarity, actually, of these things. So we had fun as convention punters, which was great fun. But I knew you were there, and you were there with Cole, and how did you find Birmingham? Yeah, straight down the M42. It was easy. Yeah, nice. It took forever to get into the car park. It was just a nightmare. Just went on the Saturday, and I was there specifically to uh, host a panel with Adam Christopher. It was good. It was good to, to actually meet Adam and have a proper chat and have a bit of a mooch around uh, MCM and actually, again, not buy anything. Did you not it's, buy it's anything? It's really weird. Not a thing. It's just, it's the third convention in a row where I haven't really bought You've anything. You've lost your or, touch, mate. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, normally at these shows, I'm scooping stuff up. Yeah. Telford, there'll be lots of different stuff at Telford, and it's one of those mm. which is coming up at the weekend, Wales Comic Con. That show has, always has lots of bits and bobs and things to look at. 
But Telford, last time I went to that show, was very laid back, and you you pop into the event, you pop out, out into the town for a coffee or a bite to eat, and then come back into the show. So it's a nice, relaxed weekend I'm looking forward to mm. there. And then, of course, in a couple of weeks after that, we've got Fire This Form, which very much looking forward to. But, yeah, MCM was really good. It was nice. It was nice to see some faces and see some friends at the show. A bunch of us went out for a bite to eat after, didn't we, which was nice. Yeah, it was good fun. It tends to be like a, a main staple of what we do at Birmingham is to try and get some kind of social going. And, yeah. you know, but it was it was good fun because it was busy. It was busier than London was, actually. Yeah, um, like, surprisingly was, yeah. busy. But, yeah, I picked up a few different items and stuff, which was quite cool one of those was a original 1977 150 piece jigsaw so i was going to ask you about this so i figured for the most part of today's episode what we'll do is we'll just make the jigsaw and count the pieces Mm -hmm. it'd be a brilliant thrilling episode so you know that would be perfect for those who are listening to this in the car and not watching it on youtube or hard of hearing yeah or hard of hearing yeah one of the other things i got actually which is something that um carl pointed out to me is a range of figures from japan which are the band presto figures these are kind of like small one and a half two inch figures slightly cutesy like their, their heads are a little bit bigger than their bodies not in the same way as the funkos um, and i picked up a really nice boba fett it's from the wave, which is called The Story of Jabba the Hutt. I'm going to get the rest of these because one of them is actually a slave layer. So the fact that there's actually a slave layer in a fairly new packaging and stuff is quite exciting. So I got one of those, picked up The Edge of Balance, which is the Justina Island and Shimi Shinya um, with the art by Mizuki Shaka. Barra. So I've probably butchered those Japanese names, which I do apologise for. So that is sat on my now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pile high of books to chomp through in the next week or so. Plenty to be going on with. I've got a pile of books like nobody's business and comics to review, but but that's not the conversation for today. No. Because there's plenty to talk about. We will kick off our conversation today with the news that Patty Jenkins has stepped away from Rogue Squadron which means that whilst that 22nd of December 2023 date remains as a slot for a Star Wars film, right now it probably won't be filled by Rogue Squadron and it certainly won't be filled by Patty Jenkins as a director. The reason they gave was that there were scheduling conflicts. Mark, okay. what do you make of that? <laughs> for, me, for me, I'll tell you, I'm not dropping I'm not throwing it at you too quickly, but, okay. but my thinking on that is that you know a massive project like a Star Wars film to use the reasoning of scheduling conflicts doesn't quite sound right. You know, she's she's an in-demand director. She's just done Wonder Woman 2. She's got Wonder Woman 3 and Cleopatra, I believe, coming up with Gal Gadot. So she's got projects on the go. But this is that big Top Gun Star Wars project that was kind of announced back in 2020. And to say mm. scheduling conflicts, that doesn't quite sound right to me. What do you think? Unless, of course... It kind of is, but not in a necessarily good way. I mean, it sounds to me like there was no conflict of creative differences or anything like that, which we've had many Star Wars directors kind of leave projects for those kind of reasons. I wonder if maybe it's because the story or the treatment or the script that she turned in wasn't what they were expecting or wasn't maybe up to the standard that Lucasfilm were hoping and possibly to get it turned around and maybe improved, there just isn't time in Patty's schedule. That's my positive take on it and my slightly more negative... Diplomatic? Yeah, that's my diplomatic one. My other one is maybe basically she kind of got fired and they just didn't want to actually say she got fired because they wanted to save face for everybody. Lucasfilm doesn't really need the press and the PR of firing another director before they've actually shot, you know, an inch of film. So it could be something like that. I mean, obviously, we're never going to find out. From where I sat, obviously, Wonder Woman 1984 was not as well received and I think it was probably not a, as strong a film as possibly we were hoping. Who knows? I mean, the thing was, for Row Squadron Sizzle, the kind of like the announcement film that Patty was in sounded like it was a very personal film to her, you know, with her dad being a pilot and stuff. So I wonder if maybe it was something that maybe only they felt would resonate with certain people rather than more of a general public. I don't know. Question to you then is like, it's interesting that they've decided to not pursue this with another director. And again, is that because they want to kind of maintain the schedule or maybe they want to preserve some kind of relationship with Patty for maybe another future project? I think what you've said is very astute in the sense that there's the truth of it, which we'll probably never know because how much do we ever really find out yeah. on these things, but also the public perception of there was issues with that original Boba Fett film with Josh Trank. There was issues with Rogue One with, with Tony Gilroy coming in. There was... There's never been that Ryan Johnson trilogy. Four years on now, no more word on that. Obviously, Lord and Miller moving on from Solo and, and Ron Howard moving in. So 
there's been issues for, with most of the films yeah. that they've done. Television seems to be bobbling along perfectly nicely, but but movies not so much. If you come to this, and then all of a sudden it's another Star Wars film that's got an issue, that's just asking for the pylon, isn't it? It's just asking exactly. for a social media pylon. Also, she's the first woman to be directing a Star Wars film. Mm-hmm. Of course, we've had Deborah Chow do television, but and and Bryce do television, but she's the first female director to do a Star Wars movie. You know, if this was a solo situation. And you're just bringing in the director to pick up where it's left off a bit like Rogue One when they did reshoots. That's kind of a different thing. But like you said, they've not shot an inch of film yet. We've just had Eternals come out, which I saw, and it was a perfectly serviceable Marvel film. It was okay, but it wasn't amazing. Chloe Zhao on that one, who's won the Oscar for Nomadland, and there were rumours and talks of her maybe working on a Star Wars film. The Kevin Feige project was the one that people had said. Yeah. And this is all just spitball and rumour on social media. There's no... Nothing more than that, but but you know now people are saying well that's probably not going to happen because Eternals hasn't done well and it's not gone down well. So Lucasfilm's in a bit of a quandary whereby primarily Kathleen Kennedy really wants to promote female directors and writers and so on and so forth as she should, of course she should. Mm-hmm. She's in a position to do it, so she should do it. But the product's got to be right and the, and the content's got to be right. And as increasingly in 2021 going forward, the PR has got to be right. So this could be seen as a PR disaster. So Patty has moved on because of a, a production schedule issue. You've kind of just got to shrug your shoulders and go, okay. The likelihood is that she was probably speaking to all different departments. You know, we'd heard that they were going to start shooting it in April here in the UK. That's only five months, six months away. So they would be deep into pre-production. Exactly. So you've got to, you've got to think, well, is there more to this than that? And as you say, do they bring in another director to push on with Rogue Squadron? You'd like to think there's other stuff on the shelf that they could pull down and, and step it. You know, if there's an issue, there's there's got to be other projects that they've got. They can't be dry. It's this is Star Wars for goodness exactly. sake. They can't be dry for projects. There's got to be other stuff out there. George had how many scripts for Underworld sitting on a shelf that never got seen? Was it 30 scripts? 30 or 40 or 50. I mean, you know, yeah. hell, they could just uh, stitch together six episodes of Detours and put that out as a theatrical. <laughs> but I mean, but things, that's the thing. The release date isn't going away. So there's still meant to be a Star Wars film being released in 2023 in December. What does your guy, okay, slight, slight left turn here okay. then, but given that there's a slot, yep. and, and just on this totally separate conversation, but it is another piece of news we posted on Fanta, Star Trek and Paramount have moved up their date from June of 23 to December 22nd, which means potentially you could have a Star Wars and a Star Trek film Ooh. out on the same day. I will not know where to turn that day. <laughs> well, look, could potentially be the busiest day of my life. But that, and that I think that would be tremendous fun as well if they did that. I think that would just be, they oh. could bounce off each other and it would just be yeah. great fun. It's, if it, people it do it in the spirit itself. it's intended. Exactly. If, yeah, and and totally. you can imagine the general like press will have a field day right? because obviously Star yeah. Trek and Star Wars can coexist. Oh, yeah. It's not like a, a scene out of um, fanboys every time we go to conventions and stuff. So <laughs> um, you would think that they would have some you know films that have been in development. Maybe it's a Taika film. I mean, obviously, as you know, this is a problem. You talk about Patty and, you know, scheduling issues with her. You know, we know that Taika is always, like, got his fingers in, like, 20 different pies and spinning 40 different plates at the same time. Exactly. So, exactly. you know, whether or not he's going to be able to just step into that gap and get his film up and running and, you know, into production really by first or second quarter of next year, otherwise it's going to be tight, isn't it? No matter what they do. What they don't want is they don't want another situation like Rise of Skywalker, for example, where JJ had so much of a crunch to get that film turned around. You know, he did it in six months less time than he than he wanted to. Wanted yeah. to, yeah. But then a part of that, as, as you know, speaking to people on on set and stuff, they shot a hell of a lot of footage. So I kind of almost think they didn't necessarily help themselves because I think they shot every permutation of every you know scene that they could do, and maybe if they'd been a little bit more economic with it they might have been able to kind of focus it a little bit more and be in the edit a little bit but moving back to it i mean mm. potentially you think maybe this is where the high republic's leading are we going to get a high republic slash old republic type era that seems to be where you yeah. know there's a lot of support from the fandom i mean other than that i don't really you know off the top of my head there's nothing that seems to be massively burning in my in my stomach at the moment to kind of say i want to see this next we've been spoiled with Mandalorian we're getting the book of Boba Fett we've got Andor coming we've got Kenobi coming both Andor and Kenobi could have equally have been uh, a motion picture totally yeah so in some respects actually now maybe they're they you know they're probably going hmm, okay what are we going to do let's have a punt and try and do something with Avar Chris or Revan or whoever 
it'll be interesting, but I'm sure we'll probably find out hopefully sooner rather than later. Hi, this is Hugh Kwashi. I've had great pleasure in recording this interview for Fan for Tracks. Disney Plus Day took place last week. Some were overwhelmed, some were underwhelmed. Some of us were just whelmed. But in there, there were a few reveals, one of which kind of leaked the day before. It was a sizzle reel for the upcoming Obi-Wan Kenobi series. It was shown at an Investor's Day last year. So this has been out in the wild for a while. There were a few clips, shots of Ewan talking about how much he's looking forward to coming back to the show. Deborah Chow talking about the character and some of the anticipation. Shots of Hayden doing a bit of training and then some beautiful pre-production artwork that gave us a good look at some of the characters, situations, potential vehicles that might be seen in Kenobi. Uh, We put a piece up on Fanta about this. What did you make of these images, Mark? Some of them are highly evocative. I've already christened the EOP that you're sitting on as Obi-Wan Kenobi. So that's, that's canon now. Thank you. And, but the, the final shot is of Ben and Darth Vader going at it. That's the shot that's the most evocative to me. That And the airspeed is obviously looks amazing. What do you think of those images that we've seen? Bearing in mind that none of them may come to pass. Yeah, very true. None of them may come to pass. But I mean, the fact that they've basically kind of said, and even Ewan kind of said about Vader and, and Obi-Wan facing off, it sounds like it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen, um, whether we like it or not. Most people are like, oh, but they never met after Mr. Far until, you know, Death Star. We don't know that. We don't know how many times or how many bouts they've had. I mean, it's a classic image. It's very evocative of Revenge of the Sith. Very much a fiery background, and it's similar in vain, you know, because they're slightly silhouetted to, like, Return of a Jedi, theatrical artwork. I really like, however... The images of Vader sat and guessing it's going to be on Mustafa's castle. I'm hoping that actually it's going to be a bit of cat and mouse. Maybe Vader starts to get like hints and the whiff that, you know, there's another Jedi out there. Maybe it's Obi Wan. Maybe it's his old master. And then they kind of just meet, you know, for like some climactic kick ass awesome battle, you know, in the final episode. The artwork looks great. There's an image of what looks like a I'm going to say it looks underwater based on the colour scheme of possibly could be like a Jedi temple or something like that with the stormtroopers or, you know, it could just be a, an Imperial installation. But it looks like it's underwater because of the Acra blue colour scheme and the window. That would just be an interesting kind of take. And then we've got some Inquisitors. So, again, that's that's some of the rumours and speculations that we've heard that was going to be Inquisitors and that. And it looks like there's an Inquisitorial ship with a at least an Inquisitor leading out a couple of uh, TKs. So the stuff that we've been hearing, which is, you know, not far off the wall kind of rumour, sounds like it could could be happening. So this is starting to form up to be an awesome show. It's certainly not going to be a show where Obi-Wan leaves his hut, walks around, comes back to his hut and shuts the door. It sounds like he's out travelling in this show. So obviously you see him on Tatooine on his EOP, but all the other images, as you say, are, for the most part, you would imagine, off Tatooine. The scenes that, that, I mean, on our gallery, it's the centre picture. It looks very much like a Coruscant, if not Coruscant, somewhere busy and bustling. Yeah. Could be any number of places, but you kind of think it could be there. Uh, Obviously, the Anakin and Obi-Wan clash has got that Mustafar feel about it, which is quite ironic. The shot of what most people would consider snow speeders that we know are actually air speeders. That looks fantastic. So there's lots there. There's there's lots to sort of take in. And as you say, possibly Mustafar with the Vader stuff. It feels like it's got, not that it wouldn't, I mean, you'd really expect it to, but it feels like it's got some serious scope there, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, I still, personally myself, I'm still not sure how we're going to get around the sense of duty that Obi-Wan's meant to be having, protecting Luke and obviously him being off planet. But there's nothing to say that actually he is the one who's off planet. It could be that another one of the um, the cast goes off planet because he can't. And also some of that, like there's no reason why you couldn't necessarily have air speeders on Tatooine. And, you know, the Inquisitorial ship looks like it's just like touched down on a, a fairly yeah. barren, dry thing. So I wonder, I wonder if it's, you know, if it's a combination of the only way you, they can get him off planet is to flashback or it's somebody else who's actually off planet. Yeah, no, that's a good shout, actually. That's a good point because there is enough there to say a lot of that could be Tatooine. Yeah. But also, yeah, you just you mentioned the flashback thing. That's a great point because I think we're kind of expecting that. If not in a massive way, certainly to some yeah. measure that you're going to see flashback. I just don't think that maybe Hayden Christensen, bearing in mind that he's, I mean, he's, I know he's not like the most prolific of actors, but you kind of think a bit like with Tamara Morrison, that if they're going to bring them back to reprise their role, if you're going to want to get the faces on the screen and not just have them underneath the helmet. Obviously, we could see 
Anakin in, in his back to type bath or something on Mr. Far again. I don't know, but it has yeah. kind of been done quickly in Rogue One. Maybe we see yeah. that again. But I just wonder if, uh, you know, maybe there is some scene or something they do in a flashback. Who knows? The artwork looks good. It, it kind of has a very Macquarie vibe to it, especially the speeders and stuff. The guy in the foreground with the, the headgear on looks very kind of Macquarie. You know, I suppose we think that we know exactly what Tatooine is, but we don't necessarily, we've not been to every city there, so maybe there is True. a city that is far more developed. And I think that was the one thing that came about from the discussions with the Book of Boba Fett, with that wide shot of that other more developed cityscape with a spire in the middle. It's like, is that another city on Tatooine or is that another planet? You know, that's where it's fun, isn't it? You know, we can speculate and I don't think there's going to be anybody's expectations are going to be too disappointed if it is or isn't on Tatooine. Book of Boba Fett, you expect him to get out and travel a bit, don't yeah. you? And if that series was mostly based on Tatooine, I don't think many would complain because it's a planet we want to see as much of as we can. But by the same token, I would be a bit surprised. But with Kenobi, if they decided to set it almost entirely on Tatooine, then that would kind of fit what your expectations for what Ben was doing between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. Mm. But by the same token, here it does kind of look and feel because how can Vader come to Tatooine? You can't really have Vader coming to Tatooine because that just puts Luke at risk. And, yeah. and it's Tatooine that's where he was raised. So there's too many questions. I think having Vader come to Tatooine raises just too many questions. But having Ben leave Tatooine, you know that Owen and Baru are in the show, so you know that. So there's got to be some interaction between Ben and, La- and Owen and Ben and Baru and you know, an understanding that Ben is purely here to protect Luke because they kind of know the score in that sense. They know who his dad was and all that sort of stuff. I think there's going to be a bit of a kitchen sink drama element to it yeah. as well. Just um, yeah. I mean, obviously just thinking... And this is probably a little bit too similar to Mandalorian, but unless, of course, Obi actually has to take Luke off planet because Vader is coming and there's nothing they can do to stop Vader coming. But rather than actually try and risk Luke being discovered, Obi just takes him off planet for an episode or something. I don't know. Completely left field in that respect. Don't imagine baby Luke's going to be kind of like eating macaroons and puking all over the place, but that could happen as well. There's a way to get them both off planet and then Obi-Wan is still fulfilling his main duty of protecting Luke. I think there's lots of options. There's lots of t- places they can take it. They're not constricted. I mean, it's it's fictional. They can go off and exactly. do whatever they want, yeah. but there's enough scope in the conversation between... And I'm really thinking the conversation between Ben and Vader on the Death Star. I would expect in this show, if they meet, which it looks like they more than likely will, if Ben doesn't call Anakin Darth at some juncture... That would disappoint me. You know, there's little things yeah. they can nod to and little, you know what I mean? There's little things they can tip the hat to. Well, this is 10 years before A New Hope. Mm. So this is the big clash before. Even if it's five years, they do another season of this in five years' time and it's five years before A New Hope. That's still, we meet again at last. Still five years. You know, it's still significant time. So so I think there's some scope there. They've just teased enough. I know some people were disappointed with Disney Plus Day, but I also think a lot of people, as, as they do, and it's the same in the Marvel fandom, They were all expecting the trailer for No Way Home and here it was people expecting another trailer for Fett and so much stuff was on the internet that I thought, wow, you're really rolling the dice with making these claims and almost everybody had to backtrack. Exactly. Yeah, it's a tricky game to play. And also, by the same token, Disney as a company and Lucasfilm, they see all this stuff. They, you know, they listen to podcasts. They see what's going on out there. They know the tone and the temperature of the room, so to speak. They could have very easily at the last minute gone, actually, we're not going to put that and or sizzle out today. We'll save that for D23 next exactly. week. Exactly. Or whatever, because yeah. people need to remember that's coming on Friday. So there's, we should be talking about that on the next episode, I would like to think. But for what they showed, as sparse as it was, I think it was pretty exciting. Got a lot to look forward to. For everything in one location, daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds, bookmark fanthatracks.com for Star Wars news 24-7, 365. One thing that we did get was that Boba Fett behind the helmet documentary. Did you get a chance to watch that? What did you make of that? 21 minutes, it wasn't long, and it didn't outstay its welcome. It was just, it was beautifully yeah. edited and really well put together. There was footage in there I'd never seen. Mm-hmm. Some of the stuff from Jedi, especially. Some of the stuff around the parade that they'd shown with Dwayne Dunham in the suit. Never seen some of that footage before. Uh, seen screenshots and such, but not, not to the level that they showed. So there was stuff in there that we'd not seen. And I think a lot of us that knew him were really touched mm. by the, the stuff they showed of Jeremy Bullock. Massively so. And, you know, it, they, they spent a, a nice kind of good 
middle section talking about him and you know it was lovely to see Maureen and you know see Jeremy's Boba collection that he's accrued over the, the years it was really nice I, I don't really think I was going into it was expecting to get as much as we did actually really you know it was going to be something a little bit bit light and fluffy just to catch those who don't really know who Boba Fett is up to speed a little bit but actually it, genuinely I thought a a really well put together piece like you said really well edited they had read clips didn't they from just about every show you know Family Guy and Robot Chicken and you know everything yeah. so that was really cool so if you haven't watched it it's definitely well worth the 21 minutes to kind of sit down and uh, just watch that because it's well worth it it was it was it was not it started off with Ben Burt you know because you've got to give credit and props to the sound design of Fett as uh-huh, well. Some people yeah. don't always pick up on the other spurs and all that sort of sound. And going through the suit, as he said, uh, seeing Pete Vilmer, a friend of both of ours in there, was very cool. Lovely focus on Rancho Obi-Wan because obviously Fett prospered and proliferated as a character within Star Wars because of the merchandise. You can't talk about Fett without talking about Jace, exactly. like Elmstock, Rocky yeah. Fire, and Fett and all that sort of stuff. Feloni, obviously, behind the new show. Danny Logan was in there as well, which is always fun to see. Yeah, it was. it was. It was a really nicely played sort of celebration if you like but I'm again I'm so pleased that they did give that focus to Jeremy because Fett is now arguably bigger and more with more profile than he's ever had and Jeremy missed it so it, it's it's nice that they took the time to make sure everybody even new people coming into Star Wars because there's new people every day understand that there was this guy called Jeremy Bullock who for generations of Star Wars fans he was Boba Fett wasn't he and he still is Hi, I'm Simon Paisley Day. I play General Quinn in Star Wars 9. You're listening to Fanta Tracks. Croydon Star Wars Charity Day was an event that myself and Paul Naylor and you, Mark, went mm-hmm. down to. Yeah. And we both went down to. It was south of both of us, Yeah, it, it was, yeah. yeah. Last weekend, as we speak, it was fantastic. It was 24 guests there. We got a bunch of audio. And here's the latest bit. It's the three of us talking to Tim Rose, the man behind Salacious Crumb and Admiral Atbar, and all sorts of other stuff. So here's our little chat with Tim Rose at Croydon Star Wars Charity Day. Roll VT. So we're here in Croydon. We're here with Tim Rose. He's stood right in front of me right now, real as day. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> what have you been up to? Because the world's been turned upside down the last couple of years, obviously. And we're just getting back into conventions. Is this one of the first ones you've done? Or have you done a few? I've done two other ones this year, but they were the first ones where actually came out <laughs> over over the lockdown I did have a couple of people contact me and say can we bring things round to your house and things so I, I did do a little bit of signing over the lockdown but uh, mostly I, I watched uh, a lot of box sets <laughs> the garden looks immaculate like everybody else and my and wife is, need another lick of paint. my wife has got me repainting the entire house now so you know, so I've stayed very busy <laughs> yeah. how are you finding it being out and about because this is a nice it's not a massive convention but it's a busy convention how are you finding it being out and around folks and getting back into the swing of it oh it's great being able to see the people again and come out and it's nice meeting people who are so enthusiastic about the Star Wars and yeah. things. Yeah. So. Well, you've been around that for a long time, obviously. Yes. Enthusiastic fans and such. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 40, 40 years now. Yeah. Does it? I mean, daft question. Does it feel like forty years, or because it's constantly con- con- conversational thing for you? Does it just still feel fresh? No, I just look at the old photographs and go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't look like that anymore, do I? No, some, somehow I changed while I was busy <laughs> busy working on things. Yes. Well, obviously, you were back for the newer films. Yes. The process completely... With Aiden. With yes. Aiden, yeah, of course, yeah. The process completely changed, I would assume, for the most part, the techniques and so on and so forth. What was the biggest difference? I know there's an awful lot to get granular about, but what was the biggest difference between back in the day and then more recently? What, did you say I'm allowed to get complaining about it or no, about no, no, no. <laughs> well you can if you want <laughs> well certainly in the early movies I had I was allowed to make much more of a contribution and have an influence right. on the character and in the new movies I was just locked in a costume in the morning and let out at night time so <laughs> do you think that's because you did such an effective I'm, I'm framing this very cleverly you did such an effective job the first time that they liked so much what you did they didn't want to deviate from that and so the parameters were different when you came back to it does that make any sense yes no I don't think that's what it was 
<laughs> As I've said to Aiden, the, the animatronics that we have to work with yeah. are better than everything. We, oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> better than anything we ever had in the good old days. But what we've lost is there's nobody who knows how to shoot animatronics now. Had a long conversation with a gentleman at the table there. Who we both, believe it or not, we're the same age. I know he looks half my age, but we're, we're the same age, Aiden and I. <laughs> so we've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and there's nuances that you understand that maybe not everybody gets. Yeah. And when you're an old guy who's done it for 40 years, you want to help people, but there's nobody who wants to hear what you have to say. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get what you mean. I get what you mean. <laughs> Was there, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what it was, was there any regrets coming back? Are you glad you came back? Were you pleased to be asked? Well, I do say that of all the old heritage characters, I'm just about the only one that can say, I'm the only one who played Akbar. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You know, I always think, you know, Dave Prowse, he always signed, Dave Prowse is Darth Vader, but there were nine people who played Darth Vader for various things. I think Dave was Darth Vader as well, yeah. but you know what I mean. Yeah, about yeah, totally. they, they never fully respected us as characters to the point of yeah. not bothering to pop somebody else in for this bit or that bit or whatever. But um, with Akbar, at least <laughs> from beginning to the end, yeah. I was Akbar. <laughs> do you think then that's why you enjoy doing events like this? Because the fans get that detail, whereas sometimes producers and creatives come and go, and it's not understood in the same way that maybe nerds like us might. Well, the, you know. the, the fans, um, I like the fact that there's a much deeper appreciation for it now. Uh, in the earlier days, it's like. Uh, so you didn't say it's a trap. Yes, I did say it's a trap, but I was inside a mask, so I got voiced over for the final thing. Oh, well, we want the guy who said it's a trap to sign this. We don't want... You know, and it's like, well, no, these things, all these things are group characters. You know, they're all... <laughs> none, none of us is a single entity unto himself when it comes to animatronics. But that's what I love about it, is you you're working together with other people and making something better than the sum total of the parts, yeah. you know, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And outside of the Star Wars Galaxy, what are you up to, apart from the garden, obviously? What are you up to these <laughs> Well, funny enough, I was torturing Aiden not too long back. <laughs> there was a big full-body suit bear. They uh, wanted a bear like uh, Bear in the big blue house, was it? And um, so we built this bear for that. But... Um, I have gone quieter. After semi-retired. After the end of the Star Wars and things, I. <laughs> and my enthusiasm. <laughs> Somehow doing the gardening is giving me as much enjoyment as sweating my butt off in a full body suit costume. That's understandable. <laughs> and, and with with modern Star Wars now, we were saying to the guys down there, to Simon, and such, you know, you've got the Mandalorian, you see this characters from his species, Galaxy's Edge, you see the monkey lizards and, and different characters. Oh, I know you're going to talk. I love <laughs> I haven't seen any of the Mandalorian. Oh, but oh, one of the it. fans did show me salacious on the spit that he was being <laughs> that was a sore I like stuff like that yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I like seeing those little yeah. comic comic bits of humor so you enjoy seeing these characters still knocking around yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, fun. Was, was Akbar your favourite character to play in Jedi or did you prefer salacious well or no actually levels? salacious yeah because he was just a puppet a hand puppet I could slip him on and I could entertain the crew with him and stuff so <laughs> He was much easier to do, and there's four much more enjoyable. I think do. I remember seeing in the making of you were having quite a lot of fun with the crew with the salacious crew. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, I remember, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. Um, he was a bit of a character. With Kerry, you know the. Um, uh, was it the Munsters where uh, Gomez Adams? Yeah. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah. And Morticia? Yeah. When I was a kid, I saw this scene where he's kissing his way up her arm, and then the doorbell rings, and he gets out a piece of chalk, and he says, I'll be back, you know. <laughs> and uh, Salacious used to do that with Carrie in between the takes. 
I'd start at her ankle and start working my way up her calf, and then they'd say, turn over. I said, oh, get me, I shall return. You know, and all this sort of thing. So she always laughed when Salacious did it. I think if I'd tried it myself, it would have been an entirely different uh, That's the first time I've been jealous today. <laughs> That's a brilliant story. I love that. Brilliant. Yeah. brilliant. Well, always good to see you. Yeah. We'll speak again soon. Thanks for your time. Mark, could you let the good listeners know how they can get in touch if they want to do so? I certainly can. It's been a while since I've done this correctly. If you want to be part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news, visit phantatracks.com or check out the free... Phantom Tracks app through the App Store to follow us on your mobile device. You can reach out to us and send in your listeners' questions by emailing radio at phantatracks.com. Comment, like, and share on any of our social media feeds at Phantom Tracks. And be sure to subscribe, leave a review, preferably a five star one, on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcatcher or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Phantom Tracks intro, Adam O'Brien for our Making Tracks opening music and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers. Remember, tune in to our Fanta Tracks news show, Good Morning Tatooine, live Sunday evenings at 9 o'clock UK time, 4pm Eastern, 1pm Pacific, on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. Uh, you can comment on Facebook and YouTube, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we should be back this week. But if we're not back this week, we'll be back next week. And I'm done. Well done. Um, so where are you off to this week? You're headed west, aren't you? Yes, I am, yeah. I'm headed west to Telford for Wales Comic Con, which makes all the sense, doesn't it? And you're headed down to Olympia? I'm headed down to London Olympia for London Film at Comic Con for the weekend with uh, Rebel Legion. So, you know, if you're there, stop by, say hi. If you say that you're actually a listener of Making Tracks, I might even have a nice Rebel Legion patch you can have to say thank you for listening. Ooh. But I do know those who do listen to a show and they won't get a patch. Only those who I don't know. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be out of patches before like 10 be o'clock on Saturday. Yeah. So. <laughs> Perfect. Enjoy Telford, and hopefully I will get to chat to you next weekend. You definitely will. You definitely will. Brilliant. And to everybody else, thank you very much for listening. Stay safe, take care, and of course, may the Force be with you. Coming up next on Fantha Tracks Radio, it's Desert Planet Discs. You so think of something. Something.